you know, I do think that the Philippines will need to arrive at a point where there can be a reasonable conversation about how to move forward. And the way that looks, it will have to be very tough talks around very specific issues, whether it's fisheries, energy exploration, and so on and so forth. I think the record is not too encouraging given the history of this, which is, you know, China has found it convenient to, as it builds up its capabilities, to kind of dictate those terms. But that will have to be the only course in which these two countries can go on. And ASEAN, as a region, doesn't always register as a priority, particularly in the security realm. And yet, it's here where if World War III is going to start, it's going to be here, not going to be in the Middle East or even in Europe, in part because those are largely regional conflicts. The tensions that we have in the Taiwan Strait and the South China Sea are truly global. You know, so it feels like the discussion about China's role in the world is increasingly being kind of eaten up by state media organizations on different sides, you know, particularly, obviously, the, the, the huge Chinese state media, you know, and there isn't really that middle space of even handedly discussing the pros and cons of China's presence is being starved in the process, I think. The China Global South podcast is supported in part by the Africa China Reporting Project at Wits University in Johannesburg and by our subscribers. Thank you. If you'd like to subscribe for daily news and exclusive analysis about every aspect of China's engagement in Africa, Asia, and throughout the developing world, go to chinaglobalsouth.com forward slash subscribe. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China Global South podcast, a proud member of the Seneca Podcast Networks. Fun to say that again. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by China Global South's managing editor, Kobus van Staden in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. Kobus, I mentioned that we're back on the Seneca Podcast Network. That's because Kaiser Guo, who is the longtime host of the Seneca Podcast and creator of Seneca and formerly of the China Project, has relaunched his Seneca Podcast as a substack. We've got the link in the show notes to it. And our show is now featured on the Seneca podcast uh, substack and that website. So we're going to be partners once again with Kaiser. So that's very exciting. We're really happy to see that he's back because in some ways, it's a little bit of a depressing time in the China media space and the China watching space, simply because the space seems to be getting smaller. And that's kind of interesting in this media universe that we live in, where you think there's just more and more of everything. But last year, of course, we saw the end of the China project. Then last week, we got news that Axios, which is the huge media company based out of Washington, D.C., is discontinuing its China newsletter. And later, we're going to see this year another brand is going to go away as well. And it's a shrinking space, Cobus, to be covering China from a kind of independent, agenda-free point of view, which is where we come from. And it's just surprising to me that 15 years into this project, I would have thought by now there would be a lot more voices, there would be a lot more outlets, and especially I would have thought that in places like Africa and Asia, we would see more dedicated coverage to China, which we have not, even though China's role in those regions has only gone up in those 15 years. This is an important and also a puzzling issue, I think, because China's influence in these regions is only getting bigger and bigger. But you're not necessarily seeing a kind of a popular readership kind of developing around these issues, even though I do think that state media is increasingly picking up on the China relationship with parts of the global south. But that is also, it's somewhat piecemeal. It's constrained by familiar constraints that we know facing state media, which includes financing and state influence and but you know kind of at the same time even though the relationship is becoming more and more important the coverage particularly in the independent space of that relationship is shrinking and facing more and more pressure you know so it feels like the discussion about china's role in the world is increasingly being kind of eaten up by state media organizations on different sides, you know, particularly, obviously, the, the, the huge Chinese state media, you know, and there isn't really that middle space of even handedly discussing the pros and cons of China's presence is being starved in the process, I think. 
in one sense, I'm not surprised that in some parts of the world, like Africa or even the Middle East, where China is still seen as a new player, rather exotic, that we're not seeing those types of media and we're not seeing that type of analysis that you're talking about and the over-representation of state media in the discourse. What's surprising to me is that that trend is also playing out here in Southeast Asia as well, where, of course, they have the longest relationship with China of anybody in the world, given the geography that's here. And it's interesting that you go from country to country in Southeast Asia, and there is huge discrepancies in the China literacy. Singapore, not surprisingly, given its wealth, has think tanks, university programs. It has a very robust media that's there, heavily state influenced, but still very, very robust, seems to generate a lot of great analysis on China, but elsewhere in Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, it varies quite a bit. And so in that sense, it's just interesting to watch these trends. And that's why one of the publications that's caught my attention over the past few months is a newsletter called ASEAN Wonk. And if you are not familiar with this, I highly, highly recommend it. It's written twice a week by an analyst based of all places in Washington, D.C., but you're going to hear from him today that even though he's in D.C., he knows what he is talking about. Prashanth Parmeshwaran is the creator and the author of the ASEAN Wonk blog, and I get it again twice a week. It is that, that those voices that are just fantastic at doing the analysis. Now, it's not specifically focused on China ASEAN, but China being what it is in this region, it ends up being a major theme. So I had a chance to speak with Prashanth, and we did a tour throughout the whole region, throughout the most of the region, actually. We covered most of the major countries in the region, just to get his take on the China angles on all these key stories, starting off, of course, with what's happening between the Philippines and China in the South China Sea. Let's take a listen now to my discussion with Prashanth Parmeshwaran. Prashanth Parmeshwaran, welcome to the show. Great to have you on the program. Great to be with you, Eric. I have been so excited to have the chance to speak with you. I'm a huge fan of the ASEAN Wonk blog. Before we get into all of the politics, the geopolitics, and everything that's going on out here in Southeast Asia, I think a lot of folks may not be familiar with ASEAN Wonk. Can you just give us the elevator pitch of ASEAN Wonk, what it is, why you started it, and what you're trying to achieve with the newsletter? Yeah, thanks, Eric. I mean, I think um, I've always sort of been interested in Southeast Asia. So I was born in Malaysia, lived in the region for most of my life before I moved over to the U.S. And so as I was undertaking all of these different roles in you know, media, policy, think tanks, business, I always kept coming back to the same question, which is, when you go to Southeast Asian countries, there's a kind of Southeast Asia conversation that's happening in these individual countries. But there's also a kind of regional conversation and a global conversation that is happening. And sometimes there's some connections, sometimes there are some disjunctures. And in the last couple of years, I think we've seen a lot of that sort of be amped up, you know, whether it's the pandemic, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, now what we have with the sort of Israel-Gaza situation. And in all of this, I think it just is very exciting and intriguing to see how these various touch points, whether it's touch points in the region or touch points more globally, interact with each other. So that's really why I kind of founded ASEAN Wonk as a newsletter. Frankly, you know, I was reading, you know, a lot of work by others. Also, I've always been a sort of interested columnist doing a lot of my own writing and scholarship and wanted to just with some sort of regular frequency, try to make sense of all of this for myself and ended up finding out that that had a big audience. So that's been great. And the thing I enjoy the most about it is, you know, these sorts of conversations with you and getting feedback from others, including policymakers who read this stuff and say, oh, that's really interesting. You know, I never thought about it that way. Or uh, the other side, which is, oh, well, I disagree with what you're saying because I have a different perspective. And I think that conversation is really interesting and it's a great thing to have with an audience. Well, we have a rather international audience, and people today are focusing a lot of tension on what's going on in the Middle East, obviously in Ukraine. And ASEAN, as a region, doesn't always register as a priority, particularly in the security realm. And yet, it's here where if World War III is going to start, it's going to be here, not going to be in the Middle East or even in Europe, in part because those are largely regional conflicts. The tensions that we have in the Taiwan Strait and the South China Sea are truly global. 
So can you maybe just help set the context for ASEAN for those who may not be as familiar with the region and why, in your view, it's important? Right. And I think it's an excellent place to start because you are talking about, in Southeast Asia, 11 very diverse countries. This is a region that has had centuries of interactions with major powers. So when you know I write on ASEAN Wonk about geopolitics or geoeconomics, the audience in Southeast Asia is very intimately familiar with this. But on the other hand, there isn't often that appreciation for individual Southeast Asian countries themselves. And I think when we have situations like the South China Sea or Taiwan, Southeast Asia tends to be viewed through that prism. And so I think to answer the question, I think it's really important to start from the fact that when we talk about ASEAN, you know, there's Southeast Asia, which I just sort of talked about, you know, that's 11 countries, you know, nearly 700 million people, fifth largest economy in the world, you know, center of major sea lanes, including the South China Sea, Straits of Malacca. But there's also the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, or ASEAN, that originally was founded to actually manage tensions between Southeast Asian countries in the middle of the Cold War. But since it was founded, which was originally, you know, a few of these countries, not Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia, because the region was divided during the Cold War, it has since expanded to include all of the countries in Southeast Asia, effectively absent East Timor, which is now going to eventually join ASEAN as well. But it has also become the convening spot for Indo-Pacific diplomacy. So, you know, every year you'll have the U.S. president, for example, going to these summits in Southeast Asia that rotate on an annual basis. And so that is something that has only happened in the last 20, 25 years. And then you have the dynamics that you mentioned, Eric, which is the South China Sea, which you know has always been there, but it's been heating up in part because China is being more assertive over the past decade or two. Countries are pushing back, but also in this context of increasing US-China competition, the United States is also stepping in. And so for these countries in Southeast Asia, And for ASEAN as a grouping, when ASEAN makes decisions through consensus, they are trying to come up with a way to maintain their own relevance and sort of manage these disputes in the South China Sea, while also being cognizant that they need help from other major powers as well to do that. So whether it's Japan, the US, the European Union, and so on and so forth. So in my sort of 20 years of studying Southeast Asia and working on Southeast Asia, I don't think I've ever seen this much interest internationally in external countries really interested in Southeast Asia and ASEAN. And so it's more than just kind of a U.S.-China game. But as you pointed out, the South China Sea, Taiwan, and the situation in Myanmar is the other one. It's really difficult to get away from these major flashpoints. And ASEAN tries to do its best in terms of adopting a sort of lowest common denominator approach and bring these countries together. But it is the case that in the South China Sea, for example, there's only four real claimants in Southeast Asia, right? It's Brunei, Malaysia, Vietnam, and the Philippines. The other seven countries in Southeast Asia and the six countries in ASEAN don't really have a direct interest. So it's an interesting question. How do you get a very diverse group of countries, some of whom have a lot of stakes, others have lesser stakes, to work on a problem and a challenge that is more internationalized? And I think we're kind of seeing both the challenges as well as the advances that ASEAN can make in that realm. Okay, well, let's pick up on some of those themes now and start our journey through Southeast Asia. We're going to start in the South China Sea with the Philippines because that, of course, is the really the topic of the day. It, almost every single day, and we cover this in minute detail, every confrontation between the Philippines and China Coast Guards gets documented in our daily coverage, in our newsletter. And what's interesting is the intensity of the confrontations and the consistency of them and the frequency are all going up. And so in your recent edition of the ASEAN Walk that came out last week, you talked about the ASEAN Australia Special Summit that's going to happen this week. And also President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. was in Australia where he spoke to a joint session of the House of Representatives. But what he did there, and I want to play a little bit of sound to get your reaction to some of his comments, is he laid down the fact that he is not going to make any compromises or concessions to China when it comes to the territorial disputes. Let's listen to remarks from President Ferdinand Marcos. Today, that peace, that stability, and our continued success have come under threat. Once again, we must come together as partners to face the common challenges confronting the region. 
Not one single country can do this by itself. I shall never tire of repeating the declaration that I made from the first day that I took office. I will not allow any attempt by any foreign power to take even one square inch of our sovereign territory. The challenges that we face may be formidable, but equally formidable is our resolve. We will not yield. So very tough talk coming from the president there. Now, it's interesting the reference to one square inch because the Chinese themselves, on many occasions going back at least 10 years, have also said they will not yield one inch of territory. So that reference to inch is very important. Now, let me just give you a flavor of what the Chinese rhetoric is. And most of it is in Chinese, but I want to play you a piece of sound from Hu Xinjin. Now, Hu Xinjin, if those of you are not familiar, he is one of the king trolls. I think of him as the Tucker Carlson of China. He is affiliated with the Global Times newspaper, which is the Communist Party's newspaper. It's a tabloid. In many respects, he's a gadfly, and you don't really pay too much attention to him. But in this particular case, the rhetoric that he's conveying is very much in line with the official rhetoric coming out of both the PLA and the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And I want to give you a a sample of some of what the folks in China are also saying about the Philippines. We advise the Philippines to think clearly. If it continues to escalate provocations, the situation in Zhenai Reef will escalate significantly, and China will firmly fight to the end. The Philippines will undoubtedly suffer the most. Its dream of overpowering China in the South China Sea is just wishful thinking. Okay, Prashant, there we have it. The rhetoric is tough on all sides. The United States has been equally adamant in its support of the Philippines under the Mutual Defense Treaty and saying that at any point, if the Philippines wants to call that in, they can. And during these confrontations, we've had P-8 Poseidon aircraft overhead. We've had the United States Navy observing them. U.S. Coast Guard cutters are in the area as well. This is an incredibly tense situation. The thing that I want to get your take on is that none of the three major actors, the U.S., the Chinese, or the Philippines, have put any off-ramps in their rhetoric or their policy, making any kind of concession to de-escalate this situation almost impossible. What do you take away from Marcos's and even Hu's rhetoric about where we are today in this confrontation? Yeah, I think we're still in a phase right now where it's a bit of a sort of feeling out period where you have President Marcos coming into office and I don't think, frankly, I was speaking to some uh, Philippine policy officials before he came to power. I don't think anyone was expecting that he would adopt this sort of strident stance towards China and and move so close to the United States. But I think that that essentially has been what has happened in part because from Marcos's perspective, that was really the option that he had given the sort of challenges he was facing from China. And so now that we have the situation, you know, I think you have the Philippines, you know, it's kind of reinforcing the alliance with the United States, working more with other countries, including Australia, Japan, and others to do more in terms of the balancing part of the situation to increase the Philippines position against uh, China. And, you know, that doesn't make Beijing too pleased, obviously. But I think at some point, getting back to the point that you mentioned about off-rams, you know, I do think that the Philippines will need to arrive at a point where there can be a reasonable conversation about how to move forward. And the way that looks, it will have to be very tough talks around very specific issues, whether it's fisheries, energy exploration, and so on and so forth. I think the record is not too encouraging given the history of this, which is, you know, China has found it convenient to, as it builds up its capabilities, to kind of dictate those terms. But that will have to be the only course in which these two countries can go on. Because the other component of this, we're talking a lot about foreign policy, but for Marcos and his domestic dynamics, you know, his issues and challenges actually don't relate much to the South China Sea. You know, much of the Philippine population agrees very much with what Marcos is doing. His concerns are primarily about propping up the Philippine economy and dealing with his family's legacy, which dates back to Ferdinand Marcos and the dictatorship in the Philippines. And he's got midterm elections that are coming up next year as well. So he needs to consolidate his domestic position, and he doesn't need this kind of over his head 
for his entire single six-year term. So something has to give. And I think we're still seeing what that's going to look like in the next couple of years. I, I mean, just going back to ASEAN for one second, there's also a parallel track where ASEAN and China have this sort of seemingly never-ending code of conduct on the South China Sea. And I don't think you'll find anyone in sort of ASEAN diplomatic circles who doesn't agree that that is moving slower than they would like. But I think that's also really important to keep there because it it reminds all of the Southeast Asian countries that even though there are four claimants in the South China Sea and Southeast Asia, all of the Southeast Asian countries will be affected if there's a major conflict in the South China Sea, because that's where you know, a significant amount of the world's trade essentially passes through. There are treaty alliance commitments, as you pointed out there earlier. So that is an important track that goes on. But the ASEAN-China code of conduct is not going to solve the situation between China and the Philippines. That's definitely going to be something that they need to work out for themselves. The role that the United States and other countries can play is to make sure there's a favorable balance of power so that these countries are able to resolve their disputes with China and that this is done so in a peaceful way and in a lawful way. And I think that's really the dynamic that hopefully will prevail in the coming year. Okay, let's pick up on that part of the conversation. I wrote a column a couple of weeks ago that said, what happens to the Philippines if Trump wins? Okay, Mm -hmm. so here we have a situation where Donald Trump has already expressed that Taiwan is not going to be a key priority for him in his next administration. He had an interview with Maria Bartiromo on Fox News. She asked him about this. He was very clear that in his worldview, Taiwan is not a top priority. For him, making a deal with China is going to be his top priority, as he's said over and over again. And this is one of the things about Trump, is that there's no subtlety or mystery to what his positions are. He wants a trade deal. He wants a deal, right? And he is willing to put the chips on the table to get the big deal with the Chinese. Already he said that uh, he can end the Ukraine war in 24 hours, I think it was, if he just brings everybody together. But he's made it clear that he supports some of the conservatives in the Congress who don't support funding the war in Ukraine. That got me wondering, would the United States go to war with the largest navy in the world, starting effectively what is a world war? over some rocks in the South China Sea. And there is a debate in Washington that's going on right now about the merits of the mutual defense treaties that should it be about an invasion of the Philippine homeland that the the United States would come to defend, or is it at any territory within the exclusive economic zone, which is in the South China Sea as well. And I'm not entirely convinced that there's a lot of domestic political support to go to war with China over some rocks in the South China Sea, the Scarborough Shoal. And so there is a strain of thought within the Chinese body politic that says, let's just wait to see if Trump wins. Because if Trump wins, the dynamic changes in their view. Because they've seen that what's happened with Ukraine, they've seen that Trump has been averse to these kinds of conflicts. I'm curious, you're in Washington, you talk with official Washington. Do you think there is an appetite to confront the Chinese in a Trump administration? Yeah, I mean, I think there's kind of two pieces to that. You know, one is, you know, it's very hard, as you said, to predict what Donald Trump would do in situation A or situation B. I think the one thing we can say is that under the Trump administration, what we did see with respect to the Philippines was there was a perception in the Philippines. And when you go to the Philippines, you still hear this from uh, some people in policy circles, that under the Obama administration, particularly with respect to Scarborough Shoal, when the United States tried to broker an arrangement between China and the Philippines, and essentially the Chinese reneged on that, and the Philippines essentially lost Scarborough Shoal, a view of some people in the Philippines was that you know, that was a moment of betrayal, really, for the U.S.-Philippine alliance. And it already showed that the United States would be unwilling to sort of commit when it came to the South China Sea. But fast forward a few years later, and you had Donald Trump come into office and take a very, very tough stance against China. And part of that was, under the Trump administration, actually, was where you first started to see more clarity, relatively speaking, about the mutual defense treaty, what would happen in the South China Sea. And that's carried on in the Biden administration as well. Now, would that necessarily sustain itself if Trump came back to office after an election? It's hard to say, but I think that Trump's line on Russia versus China and the kind of views you have in the Republican Party on Russia and China are quite different. 
because the China threat is seen as more of a challenge, relatively speaking, than the Russia challenge or the Russia threat. There's more unity around that. But whether that translates into the South China Sea more specifically, that remains to be seen because, you know, there's much more talk even now in Washington on Taiwan than there is on the South China Sea. In fact, the Philippine ambassador to the United States, I think, just said something to the effect about a few days ago that in spite of the fact that we're talking a lot about Taiwan, we need to be talking more about the South China Sea, an eventual scenario. Frankly, I mean, I do think that it's very difficult for me to see if there's an overt sort of Chinese confrontation against the Philippines, a U.S. president not doing anything if it was so clear that China was infringing on Philippine rights, given how big the asymmetry is and how big the situation is with respect to the sort of China conversation in Washington. But of course, if there are shades of gray, if you know there are questions around you know who did what and you know what ship ran into which one, you know there could be some uncertainty around that. But I think even under a Trump administration or a second Biden administration, we will see U.S. policy on the South China Sea, at least when it comes to the U.S.-Philippine alliance, be quite constant. There'll be some change, but mostly continuity. Now. The bigger question, though, is the Philippines and domestic politics, because you had, you know, a few years ago, you just had Rodrigo Duterte, who was trying to end parts of the U.S.-Philippine alliance and was actually setting aside this international ruling that the Philippines won. So I think we also need to keep in mind, and in my last trip to the Philippines, you know, I heard this from, you know, a lot of the Philippine sources that I trust a lot. Even as you see Marcos and the current Philippine government take a very tough line on China, that is no guarantee. That, you know, every six years, the Philippines, you know, changes its position and has a very different leader. So that's the other piece of the equation that I think we have a lot less certainty on. And we're going to have midterm elections in the Philippines next year. Marcos's domestic political position, as I said, pretty strong on these security issues, foreign policy issues. Still remains to be seen, though, on some of these more kind of family legacy issues, economics and so on and so forth. And it's good that you brought up Duterte because this is also one of the domestic political issues that Marcos is facing is that there's real challenges from the Duterte factions pressuring him not only on China, but on crime and any number of issues. And so the Duterte faction is uh, something interesting to watch. Before we move on to other countries, because I do want to get some other takes of yours from the different parts of the region here, what's your forecast for the rest of the year in terms of how you think things are going to play out between China, Philippines, and the U.S. in the South China Sea? What do you see happening? I think there is a good chance that things may get worse before they get better. I think we're at a place right now where the Philippines last year was still trying to get some of its alignments and kind of networking in order, sort of working through the starting of joint patrols with the United States and Australia, still talk of some sort of access agreement with Japan. But these things are going to happen in 2024, and they're going to happen much more frequently. And I don't see China sort of easing its pressure in the South China Sea at all. So, you know, I think there's a big chance that some sort of mini crisis could happen. And that's very worrying because you've got a mixture of dynamics. Like I said, you know, you've got the U.S. election here, which is going to happen later this year. You've got the Philippines preparing for a midterm election as well. And you've got, you know, other countries in the Indo-Pacific as well. I mean, Australia is going to be having an election within the next year or so, right? So these dynamics are very troubling because they affect foreign policy, but they also affect domestic dynamics there as well. Well, let's move on to Indonesia, another major country in the region and arguably, in my view, the most important country in Southeast Asia, just given its sheer size. There is a new president in waiting. Can't call him president elect yet because I think the official presidential election committee has not declared him to be the president, but Prabowo is waiting in the wings. Already, Chinese ambassador Liu Kang went to the private residence of Prabowo, had some pictures taken with his cat, I think his cat was named Buddy or Danny or something, and they were naming the cat. (laughs) But it was very interesting to see how the Chinese in many ways are moving ahead of the other major powers in acknowledging Prabowo's presidency. So the United States and India and Japan have all held back on their congratulations. They congratulated for a successful election, but are yet to congratulate Prabowo on his win because, again, it has not been announced formally by the election commission. So... The Chinese see a big, big play in Indonesia, both because of the market, 
for Chinese goods, also because they feel that Indonesia is an important Muslim state in the world, world's largest Muslim population. Indonesia has been silent on issues like Xinjiang. Indonesia has also been very important for the Chinese on critical minerals, namely nickel. So it's an important country all around. Give us your take on the new president, the new direction, and the pressures that Prabowo was going to be under between the United States and China. Yeah, I think as you said correctly, Eric, I think, you know, a lot of countries are still trying to manage this period where essentially, you know, Prabowo is the likely president, but we don't have a sort of full confirmation yet. And even once we get that, we still have a period until October, essentially, when he's going to be inaugurated. So there's still a bit of a runway, actually, for President Jokowi, who's the president right now, to sort of carry out some of his policies, at least towards the end. And you're seeing countries like Australia, for example, The defense minister was just there in Indonesia and actually agreed on a defense agreement with uh, Indonesia that's going to be quite far-reaching and significant. Australia is also convening a summit, special summit with uh, ASEAN, which you referenced in the ASEAN Wong piece that we just put out. And that's going to really showcase Australia's diplomacy with all of the Southeast Asian countries, including Indonesia. But with Prabowo more specifically, I mean, I think... The thing with Prabowo is he's a very known quantity. I mean, if you talk to Southeast Asian policymakers, you know, everybody's familiar with him, but he's very unpredictable in terms of policy. So you have this kind of juxtaposition between a known quantity personally, but someone who's unpredictable on specific policy issues. So Prabowo could, you know, say something as he did at the Shangri-La Dialogue, right, last year, when he sort of talked about kind of peace plan for Russia and Ukraine, but he hadn't cleared it you know, with the other agencies fully in back in Indonesia. And so some people got excited about it. Other people who kind of knew Prabo and the domestic dynamics were a little bit more cautious. And I wrote a piece at the time sort of saying that, you know, we need to be very wary about um, people jumping into conclusions that either Prabo is going to represent a third term for Jokowi or Joko Widodo, the current president who's been ruling over Indonesia for the past decade. So that's one extreme, you know, it's kind of a Jokowi third term. Or the other extreme, which is, you know, this is somebody who's had human rights violations against him, you know, kicked out of the military, issues and a bad record with respect to East Timor, and very sort of protective of Indonesia's sovereignty. So he's going to be a sort of anti-democratic figure who's going to be, you know, very problematic for countries to engage. I mean, I think Prabowo is somebody who is very politically savvy. So he will, you know, when you present him with two very extreme options, you know, he'll navigate them, you know, he'll speak to one audience, one way, another audience, another way. So I think we should be very wary about those two extremes or caricatures. I think what we will see is a mix of continuity and change from Jokowi. I think we will see some of the major policies that Indonesia has carried out. You pointed out policies with respect to nickel and critical minerals. That has not gotten a lot of good press uh, with respect to international businesses, but it's done really well for Indonesia in terms of solidifying its position in the international market. So you might see that sort of instances where, you know, some people call it economic nationalism, the Indonesians call it downstreaming. I think you'll see some continuity on that. But you may also see some change. I mean, one place of change that I'm looking very sort of interestingly at is Jokowi was somebody who had a very domestic and economic focused foreign policy. Prabowo, on the other hand, is somebody who's very, very active and very comfortable saying things, talking to diplomats. He loves the international scene and the international image. So what will that mean for Indonesia, which is the you know fourth largest country in the world, third largest democracy, largest Muslim majority country in the world, and you know, largest economy in Southeast Asia. What is that going to mean for it on the international stage? Is it going to be more active on issues, even, you know, perhaps the Israel Gaza situation, you know, Russia, Ukraine? It might be very difficult for Indonesia to actually do anything about that, but they might say a whole lot more. And we might have a lot more press and a lot more scrutiny of Indonesia's foreign policy than we did under the Jokowi administration. I think it's still too early to tell how his policy is going to be with respect to the U.S. and China. I would just point out one thing, which is Prabowo, in spite of the fact that people mentioned that, you know, he was banned from visiting the United States, human rights violations, so on and so forth, you know, he was trained in the U.S. And as defense minister, he's actually pushed for a lot of defense deals in favor of the U.S. On the other hand, he's also said and is known to believe that if Indonesia needs to develop itself, and China is where the money is, well, that's where Indonesia needs to engage for that. So it might be the case where we see Indonesia lean 
more towards the United States for sort of security and military assistance and looks for alternatives in places like Japan. But it doesn't stop its relationship with China economically because that's so fundamentally important for Indonesia. There is no indication whatsoever from anything that Prabowo has said that he's going to take a side between the United States and China. I think you're right. He's going to use it as a buffet where he's going to take what he wants, which suits him well. And by the way, that's a tactic that most countries in Asia, Africa, the Middle East and others are doing as well. You see this all over the Middle East where they look to the United States for security and they look to China for economic engagement, also diplomatic support, ideological alignment. So you'll have a country like Saudi Arabia that still relies heavily on U.S. security infrastructure, but at the same time is deep in, involved in terms of economic engagement with the Chinese. Let's go over to Malaysia very quickly. Some comments that came out last week from Prime Minister Anwar Ibrahim, uh, and he's, he told the Financial Times, quote, why must I be tied to one interest? I don't buy into this strong prejudice against China, this China phobia. And those remarks got a lot of coverage here in Southeast Asia, and it really picks up on the sentiment that you hear in Singapore and in many countries that they see the rise of Chinophobia or China skepticism or anti-China sentiment in the U.S. and Europe, and they don't feel the same way. They recognize they have to live with China. They may be suspicious of China. There are very complex relationships with the ethnic Chinese minorities in these countries, but they're not buying into some of the tone that's coming out of Washington in particular on this. And Anwar Ibrahim articulated that in very forceful ways. I'd like to get your reaction to that. Yeah, I mean, I think as you correctly put it, Eric, I think most of Southeast Asia is very uncomfortable with even the framing of bipolar U.S.-China competition. Take Singapore, for example, right, which is a country that's very close security-wise to the United States. You know, Singapore's prime minister has said directly and publicly, the U.S. is competing with China, but Singapore is not competing with China, right? So that's a competition that's happening between the United States and China. You know, for Singapore, what Singapore has to do, or any Southeast Asian country, is, as you correctly said earlier, how do I get the most from China, and how do I get the most from the United States, and how do I diversify my relationship so I can do better for my economy, my people, and my own political party and my own political future, right? So that is the calculation in Southeast Asia. And I think, you know, Anwar Ibrahim is reacting in part to that. The only thing I would add to that is that the striking thing about Prime Minister Anwar Ibrahim is that, you know, this is somebody who, you know, has deep political history, very politically experienced, Lots of connections, actually, internationally, including the Middle East, most of Asia, and the United States, right? Which, which sort of backs well, like, him. Like Prabowo, this guy's been around for a long time. Exactly. I mean, these guys are old players in the game. Exactly. And so he's somebody who is very comfortable sort of in a Western audience, or an Asian audience. You know, wherever he is, he's able to sort of adjust and sort of uh, play his cards in Malaysia's interest. I think one additional thing that has happened over the last year or so is that you've had the situation with respect to Israel and Gaza. And that, you know, has affected all of the Southeast Asian countries in different ways. But I think in Malaysia, in part because it's a Muslim majority country, which still doesn't recognize the state of Israel officially, but also in part of because Anwar's own personal beliefs, because, you know, a lot of people remember Anwar, the sort of democracy figure. But before that, Anwar was an Islamist. I mean, that's how he entered into politics originally. And so we're seeing a lot of that earlier version of Anwar, who's very kind of supportive of the Palestinian cause, is also, you know, very comfortable in this kind of non-aligned uh, framing. And he's taken this, you know, quite personally. I mean, it, you've had a number of Muslim-majority countries express concerns about the Palestinians, but I'm not aware of any other country where you've had the prime minister or the sitting head of state, you know, don a Palestinian scarf and lead a protest, right, in Malaysia, which is what Anwar Ibrahim did. So I do think some of this is about China, but I think some of it is also that Malaysia looks a little unbalanced because as it's cultivating these linkages with China, the relationship with the United States is kind of caught in this kind of Israel-Palestine issue. When in fact, you go a couple of years back, one or two years back, the United States and Malaysia were cooperating on various areas, including semiconductors, for example. There were conversations about educational exchanges and so on and so forth. And I think those conversations can still occur. But this issue has complicated it, and I think it's affected Malaysia's balance. And so I think you're also seeing Prime Minister Anwar Ibrahim react a little bit to that situation. 
Well, sticking on the theme of great power competition, which has been the overarching construct of our conversation today, last year, the Vietnamese gave a master class in how to balance the two powers off each other. They have something here called bamboo diplomacy. And the idea is that, you know, bamboo bends with the wind, but it never breaks. And this idea that the Vietnamese, and we had this great conversation with a Vietnamese scholar, Kang Vu, earlier on, and I encourage you, if you haven't listened to that show, to go back and listen to it from about four or five weeks ago. And he gave a fascinating dissection of why the Vietnamese are always going to favor China because of geography and history and size and strength. But at the same time, they're always going to make sure that their options are maximized. And so last year, Vietnam was the only country in the world that got visits from both Biden and Xi. At the same time, as you documented in ASEAN Wonk, they went on a flurry of upgrading of diplomatic relations and security ties. And there has been engagements with the Australians, the Indians, the Japanese, three of China's major rivals in the region, not to mention the United States as well. You were in Hanoi earlier. Tell us about the Vietnamese position in 2024. Right. So I think, Eric, as you pointed out, you know, I was in Hanoi right after she had visited. And so I got a chance to talk to some sources on the ground about how do they think about where Vietnam is in terms of these relationships after a you know very active year of alignment and realignment and i think you know one part of that is yes you know vietnam had a year which was very sort of action filled if you will right um, having uh, president biden go to vietnam and also by the way miss the asean summit which also reinforced you know the significance of the us vietnam sort of bilateral relationship and then you had you know china but also other engagements i mean vietnam for example strengthening its relationship elevating its relationship with japan making inroads there with Australia, for example. So lots of actions. I think there's one other piece to that, which is I do think that for the Vietnamese, they're in a bit of a conundrum. And that conundrum is, you know, now that they have done this, you know, you've had Biden there, you've had Xi there, there might be, and I got this sense from, you know, one or two sources who were looking ahead at 2025 and expressing, you know, what were their concerns looking at the next year or so, that there might be a tendency to sort of say, now that we've kind of balanced between these two powers, Vietnam is going to be moving slowly towards the party Congress and preparing for more domestic politics. There's going to be eventually some sort of leadership transition there as well. You've got elections coming in the United States as well. You might have even a different administration. The thing that people kept impressing on me was that there needed to be uh, sort of attention to follow up and making sure that there are deliverables. So the fact that the U.S. and Vietnam had a double upgrade was great. They made a lot of inroads on things like semiconductors, which is quite significant. But there's a lot of work that still needs to be done in order to actually concretize that cooperation. And some of that is in the Vietnamese domestic system. Some of that is going to be in the U.S. domestic system as well. One other piece of that is that for Vietnam, there's been a lot of conversation about Vietnam and the sort of China plus one supply chain. So the fact that, you know, if companies are looking to move out of China or diversify their operations apart from China, they're going to look to Vietnam for that. The challenge for the Vietnamese is that that only works if Vietnam is able to be a place of independent supply chains. And what you're actually seeing happening thus far is not a lot of that so far. What you're seeing is a lot of Vietnam's economic dependence on China is actually growing. If you look at it in the last four or five years, in fact, within the last few years, Vietnam has become the largest trading partner within ASEAN with respect to China. So the Vietnamese are quite exposed economically in that. And so the big question is going to be, as they get these big China plus one supply chains and diversifications, are they truly going to be moving from it to an independent supply chain? Or are they going to be attached more to a China supply chain that's actually more regional? And that's not a conversation just for Vietnam. That's also... I was yeah. just about to say, that's the whole region, actually. I talked to a shoe manufacturer a couple of weeks ago. I went out to dinner with a friend of mine who's in the shoe business. And he said he went to Malaysia, actually, to talk about a China plus one to diversify. And the Malaysians looked at him and said, no, you don't understand. All of our inputs come from China. We just assemble here. So everything, all the inputs, the rubber, the shoe, the leather, is processed and made in China. So you're having autonomous, non-Chinese supply chains here in Southeast Asia, 
very, very difficult because most of these countries don't have the capacity that China has to manufacture the inputs at scale. So all of that rubber, the plastic, all the pieces that go into making stuff is made in China but assembled other parts of Southeast Asia. That's not really a China plus one strategy. That's a China plus 0.5, if you will. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, and maybe even less, you could argue, right? Because the other dynamic that's happening is you're seeing some Chinese companies move into other parts of Southeast Asia and rebrand or cooperate with other Southeast Asians and actually rebrand themselves as Southeast Asians. So the idea of, you know, that we can separate a Chinese company or a Chinese supply chain from partner supply chains or Southeast Asian supply chains, it, it's, it's very complicated, right, to be able to do that. And so to pretend like this is something that, you know, you can just have parallel systems, I think it's quite simplistic. The other part of that is if you're trying to climb up the value chain, that's a very easy thing to say. But let's say you're talking about the Vietnamese, you know, they think about things in terms of ecosystems. So if you're talking about a semiconductor ecosystem, you don't just need the technology. I mean, you need the manpower, you know, you need the skilling, you need the education. So that's not just going to come from the United States. You know, that's going to come from cooperation from a bunch of different countries who need to do this very quickly. And so you're seeing Vietnam roll out some of these targets over time. But this is going to be a very heavy slog in terms of the semiconductor competition. Remember that Intel canceled a factory here in Vietnam. And one of the reasons why they bailed on this billion dollar factory was because there wasn't the human resources to manage it. So that education piece is absolutely critical. And while you, just to your point about elections and changes of leadership, while Vietnam does not have elections, there may be, as you indicated, a change of leadership at the top. Yun Phun Trong, who is the general secretary of the Communist Party of Vietnam, he's almost 80 years old. There's been concerns about his health. He did not show up at a couple events earlier this year. So there are concerns that he is, again, approaching the age that, what, he's young by an American leader standard, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> but, he is, uh, but he is old. And it's interesting because he is among the last of the post-war generation that they fought in the war. This new generation of leaders, the president, for example, is in his 50s. That is a new generation that's waiting in the wings to take over. And it's going to be very interesting to see their worldview because they were not framed by the war. And so that will be shaped by it. We don't have a lot of time left, so I just want to go very, very quickly if we can. Cambodia is a very interesting country. I think the perception in many parts of official Washington and Brussels is that Cambodia is a vassal state of China, a complete bought and paid for ideologically outpost of the Chinese. And yet, and yet, two Japanese maritime self-defense force destroyers made a port of call in Cambodia last week. Also, this week, we got news that the United States military and the Cambodian military are looking to upgrade their cooperation and some of their training. Very interesting. Looks like the Cambodians may be taking a page out of the Vietnamese or the Filipino playbooks and trying to diversify some of their relations beyond China. Of course, the Cambodians and the Chinese are very, very close, but I'd like to get your take on how Cambodia is playing the game right now. Right. And I think, you know, Eric, uh, as you mentioned, this is something that we see in different parts of the region. So you've had a transition now from Cambodian Prime Minister Hun Sen to his son, Hun Manet, who is somebody who shares similar views with his father in some ways. And his father still has, you know, a lot of control within Cambodia. But my sense is that with Hun Manet, you know, he's very seized with this idea of bringing in more investment for Cambodia and kind of selling and developing the Cambodian story, you know, rather than having this be kind of a U.S.-China conversation. So as you said, you know, the fact that Cambodia is reaching out to countries like Japan, they've been doing actually a lot of investment promotion, even in parts of the Middle East, for example, I think is part of that. You're seeing the Cambodians look for alternate sources of growth and diversity. I suspect we'll still see a lot of that. One thing that Probably won't change, though, is, I mean, there are very tight controls in Cambodia. You know, relative to 10, 15, 20 years ago, Cambodia used to be a very free place, relatively speaking, for journalists to be. That hasn't been the case in the last few years. Maybe that might change. But for now, we haven't really seen that thus far under Hun Manet. But we'll see how that plays out. And he has been on the road a lot. He was in Bangkok and, and he was just in Malaysia meeting with Anwar. So he's the salesman in chief for Cambodia. A very different approach than his father, no doubt. And so let's end our discussion very quickly on the situation in Myanmar. 
there's been a coalition of ethnic insurgents that have presented the most significant challenge to the ruling military junta. There's been violence on the borders with India and with China. In fact, shells came over the border into China towards the end of last year. The Chinese have had this awkward relationship with the junta. On the one part, they see the China-Myanmar economic corridor as being vital to their economic interests. They have been probably more accommodating of the junta than any other major government. But at the same time, there is a lot of frustration between the two governments. The Chinese are fed up with the instability. They don't like the pressure that's coming on their border, uh, potential migrant flows coming in and whatnot. Give us the lowdown as you see it in Myanmar, particularly as it relates to China. Yeah, I think the big variable there is kind of the domestic situation in Myanmar itself, where you've seen actually the basically the opposition forces to the ruling junta government, which took power in a coup, actually exert a lot of influence and make a lot of inroads in the country. And what you're seeing China doing was China initially was quite close to the junta government, but they've been you know a little bit more flexible of late over the past few months in terms of trying to balance between the interests that you pointed out Eric which is securing their own interests in Myanmar but also you know frankly not being sure about how the situation is going to pan out in 2 3 4 or 5 years i think i was speaking to one chinese source that was mentioning to me and i basically asked what are the stakes for china in 5 you know 10 or 15 years and essentially his response was well this is going to be a long game, not a short game. So yes, China is going to have to navigate its interests, balance its interests. But the real big question is, you know, how's the situation in Myanmar going to turn out? Because if you're the Myanmar junta, what are you going to be thinking? It's pretty simple, which is, you know, do what the junta and the military have been doing for decades, which is wait opposition forces out and believe that time is on your side. But the big issue there, of course, is that the people of Myanmar are going to be suffering as that happens. And we haven't really seen the junta be able to exert a lot of control. Now, the big variable here, obviously, is the United States and other countries that have you know, been imposing sanctions and restrictions on the regime. But, you know, we were at this place a few decades ago, right, before the opening with Aung San Suu Kyi and so on and so forth. So we're seeing the same cycle play out. And the big question to my mind is, if the situation drags out 10, 15, 20 years, and it's just China and Russia having influence in Myanmar, how does the rest of the international community respond to that? And how does the international community balance between sort of short-term restrictions on Myanmar, but also making sure that in the long run, the people of Myanmar get a fair hearing and they're not kind of isolated and being even more kind of in the sort of China camp or the Russia camp or whatever you want to sort of call that. I mean, the big theme in Southeast Asia, as you know, Eric, is people want alternatives. They don't want choices, right? When you ask people about, you know, do you want more of the US, more of China? It's, you know, all of the above plus, you know, Japan plus Australia, so on and so forth. We hear that over and over again, over and over again. It's a both and equation rather than either or. Prashant, thank you so much for taking us on this journey across Southeast Asia. Absolutely fantastic to get your insights on everything. And as you guys can hear, Prashant knows his stuff. And if you want to get inside Prashant's brain, all you have to do is sign up for the ASEAN Wonk newsletter. Prashant, tell everybody where they can find the newsletter and what it costs and how frequent it comes out. Sure. So it's a twice weekly newsletter covering Southeast Asia and Indo-Pacific geopolitics and geoeconomics. And you can find it at ASEANWONK.com. So that's A-S-E-A-N-W-O-N-K.com. And it's uh, $5 a month, $50 a year. Okay, we'll put a link to that in the show notes. So if you'd like to sign up, and I sign up, so I highly recommend that you do as well, you can click on that link in the show notes. Prashant, thank you so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Great to be with you. Well, Kobus, there you have it one more time. We Another guest on this show telling us that the equation is not an either-or equation as it's framed so often by the United States. And it's a both-and equation. That is that... Countries in Southeast Asia, exactly like countries in Africa and elsewhere, do not want to have to choose. They keep saying this, but there is clearly a very, very strong message from the West that is provoking people to kind of feel that they have to reassert this statement over and over again, that they want to be able to choose the best from the United States, the best from Europe, the best from Japan, the best from China. But that message, I think, is still lost on a lot of folks in the D.C. Beltway. 
I think there is a, a kind of a fantasy among Western powers that the West can provide everything that the world needs. And so they have to keep being reminded that that's not actually the true, which is always a kind of an unwelcome message to them, I think. Yeah, and it was so interesting, Prashant was saying about how the dynamics vary from country to country to some extent, and certainly there's a lot of difference between the Philippines and Vietnam, given the politics, the history, of course, uh, you, you know, and, and the realities of what they confront with China today. But you just think to yourself, if the United States only adopted a little bit more nuanced policy in how they engage these countries, again, not trying to frame it as an either or zero sum. And again, this runs counter to the narratives coming out of the State Department where they will tell you ad nauseum that we do not want countries to have to choose. But the underlying messages are very much binary. And, and I think that is potentially confusing to a lot of observers, but certainly a lot of countries by virtue of the fact that they have to restate this thing over and over again, that they don't want to have to choose, clearly indicates that they are under some kind of pressure to take sides in this burgeoning duel between the U.S. and China. Yeah, and I mean, you know, that is where the kind of new Cold War, you know, kind of thing really, where the rubber hits the road, you know, is the way that that it, it translates into a set of pressures on global South policymakers, you know, that don't necessarily take into account their own development priorities, for example. Okay, well, let's leave the conversation there. Thank you for joining us today, Cobus, and for some of those insights. Again, we are so excited to be back on the Seneca Podcast Network. If you want to catch this show over on Kaiser Guo's blog, go ahead and just click the link in the show notes. And of course, if you want to subscribe and get the transcripts, get our AI engine, get all the wonderful things that we produce every day at the China Global South Project, including our China Global South Daily Brief, go to chinaglobalsouth.com slash subscribe. We also offer half-off subscriptions for students and teachers. So email me, eric at chinaglobalsouth.com, and I will send you the links for the half-off discount for students and teachers. Remember to use your academic email, and I will send that to you right away. So for Kobus van Staden in Johannesburg, I'm Eric Olander in Ho Chi Minh City. We'll be back again next week with another edition of the China Global South podcast. Until then, thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Follow the China Global South Project on Twitter at China GS Project and share your thoughts on today's show or head over to our website at ChinaGlobalSouth.com where you can subscribe to receive full access to more than 5,000 articles and podcasts. Once again, that's ChinaGlobalSouth.com.